I'm Steve McLaughlin, Dean of the Georgia Tech College of Engineering, and this is The Uncommon Engineer. We're just absolutely pleased as punk to have you with us. Please say a few words. Without insurance, our medical bills could be thousands of dollars with each routine trip to the doctor. And some of the care we need isn't covered by insurance at all, like hearing aids, for example, which can run you close to, say, $5,000. But why do they cost so much? Welcome to another episode of the Uncommon Engineer podcast. I'm Steve McLaughlin, Dean of the Georgia Tech College of Engineering. The Uncommon Engineer discusses how Georgia Tech engineers make a difference in our world, in our daily lives, and in ways you might not expect. Our guest today is Dr. Saad Bamla. He's a professor in the School of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering here at Georgia Tech. He's going to talk to us about his work in what people are now calling frugal science and the impact it's having on the medical field. In fact, his new hearing aid is only going to cost $2. Welcome to the program, Saad. Thank you. So let's start with you explaining just what the idea behind frugal science is. I think people understand the word frugal and the word science, but it's a research area now. So can you uh, explain what it is? A part of my lab focuses on this uh, philosophy or research theme of frugal science. And the way we think about this is that we share this planet, uh, you know, with about 7 billion other people. We don't have infinite resources. And there are these grand challenges that we are faced with, whether with human health or even planetary health. And so the motivation for us is how do we think about solutions and develop technologies that scale, not just for you and me sitting here in Atlanta, but for billions. And so our philosophy is, can we think about it at, you know, we choose a number and it has some meaning and I can explain as a dollar, which, uh, you know, for where I grew up from in India, an annual uh, healthcare budget for an average person is about dollar, two dollars, two dollars, 50 cents. So often our devices, which are focused on enabling uh, science or healthcare, if we ask somebody to buy or sell something, which is hundreds of dollars, that's just ridiculous. So we choose a dollar because that's kind of the box we put us in, and that's the frugal. We, most of our devices typically cost about a dollar, and then we kind of think outside the box of this one dollar to come up with solutions. Often with our inventions, it's not just a matter of engineering, often we are pushing the limits of our own ability to choose new materials that might not have been used. Mm -hmm. And although we're almost, in a sense, reinventing things, say, think about reinventing the wheel of today, you and I were to reinvent the wheel. Would we use the same materials that we had access to, say, about 100 years ago, or would we think about access to newer materials? And so it's essentially allowing us to use what we know today as scientists about the physics of materials, soft materials, actuators, and ask what is possible within the constraints of keeping this at a lower cost. It forces us to you know, think a little bit more scientifically. And often with these devices, it's not a matter of solving a problem, but building key uh, workhorse devices or platforms, as we were discussing earlier. So it enables other people. So often we have to think a little bit more, bit more scientifically on what are kind of the limits on this thing and what's possible. And I think what what we're all used to, I think, as scientists and engineers, mostly as researchers, is you know when we think big, we think about solving big problems. We think about oh, that's expensive, right? I yeah. mean, to to come up with a solution yeah. for a big problem, 
I, and I will, I'm guilty of that, thinking that those big solutions are routed or rooted yeah. in something big and expensive. And you're saying, well, what if we just start from the beginning and totally turn that on its head yeah. and say, let's start with cost yeah. and then ask what problems can we solve? Yeah. And like you said, arrive, uh, have to take a completely different path to a solution by starting at that point. What I have in my hands is essentially a piece of paper. It's a circular piece of paper that's uh, uh, that I have a fishing line, a string, just poured through two holes in the center of this disc, and the strings are attached to PVC pipes that you might have in your kitchen or your garage. And I'm going to spin it, and I'll let you kind of uh, you know use your sense of hearing to see what it sounds like. <laughs> This object is what we call a paperfuge, and uh, this is our take on a low-cost centrifuge. So this is one of our frugal science devices. So I have a question for you, Steve. When I spin this, and you can hear the sound, how fast do you think this object is rotating? It's whirring pretty, uh, pretty loud, so I'll think in terms of revolutions, per uh, revolutions per second. How many times is this spinning each second? And I'm going to say, I don't know, four or five, something like that? It's actually 25,000 RPM. Uh, that's a heck so of a that's... lot faster than four or five <laughs> revolutions per second. <laughs> incredible. Uh, that's incredible. You know, the problem that we were trying to solve is centrifuges, and uh, we had just come back from the field in Uganda where we were trying to do diagnostics for malaria and for helmets. And the context of this problem is that even if you and I were to go to, say, Emory Hospital today, a common test that people do is take your bodily fluids, whether it's urine, stool, blood, and often we are looking for some biomarkers or infectious diseases, so you're looking for parasites. So the challenge always is finding needles in a haystack and you have to concentrate things and that's what a centrifuge is. It's kind of a workhorse for any biology lab, whether you think cell biology or biomedical lab. And here we were in the middle of this place where there was no electricity. So you have a centrifuge. It's not as if you don't have one, but it's akin to, you know, just a, piece, a big piece of uh, metal just sitting there, useless. So we'd come back and, you know, realize that without this, we can't do diagnostics. And we have a lot of patient data that just you can't do. And so we were challenged with trying to find a clever way of doing this. And as all scientists and engineers do, we look in our kitchens and our garages and we discovered that other people had come up with ideas like egg beaters would be one, salad spinners would be one, and those devices go about a few thousand RPM. It turns out that that's not enough to actually separate out plasma from red blood cells to do a simple test. So we were looking for what is the upper limit, and so this is where the science comes in. The way I thought about it from my physics background is, you know, what is the most efficient way to actuate an object such that I can apply my muscle energy, my human hand energy, to rotate an object? And so the aha moment came because my grandmother used to give me these buttons to play with as a kid. And so I don't know if you played with this as a kid, but this is where the inspiration was. And when I put this on a high-speed camera to visualize this because it made this noise, it turns out it's not a few hundred RPM. This spins at 25,000 RPM. Wow. And so we turns out it's one of the oldest toys that we know. We found archaeological samples. So it's one of the oldest toys civilization. No, but nobody had figured out the physics of this object. So we tried to figure out the co complex physics behind this. We engineered these things to go up to 125,000 RPM. Wow. All of this for, you know, sense. And of course, what it means in real life is now you can take a droplet of blood and uh, you see there are small plastic shims over here. You take scotch tape, you tape a capillary filled with about 10 microliters of blood, which is just a drop, and within 30 seconds, it'll separate out w to plasma and uh, red blood cells. So that's a test for anemia that affects almost a billion people. You brought a couple other things with you today. I think they might be kind of things that you're working on, may not want to share too much, but I think one thing looks like a regular lighter, yeah. like a Bic kind of butane lighter. What, what's, it's, and so for listeners, I'm looking at a, a, a butane lighter. Yeah. The reason I brought this, and this is when I uh, give talks as well, often the question is, how do you come up? with a solution to a problem, how do you come up? Is it just random chance or is there a system? And as an educator, for me, it's important to be able to teach people, right? I would like, you know, everybody be, to be able to 
develop these frugal tools. So here's a problem uh, that a bunch of high schoolers brought to me from rural Georgia in a public school, and they said they needed an electroporator. These kids are part of a international no. team of called the International Genetically Engineered Machines Competition every year at MIT, and they just actually won gold. And so the idea they wanted to do was they wanted to uh, do synthetic biology and take E. coli, a bacteria, and modify it to make it into a sensor to uh, make it as a test for, say, cholera. Challenge is to actually modify, and you know, today you'll hear about te techniques such as CRISPR and you know other techniques. A key central part of this is electroporation, which is a, what you do is you apply a huge voltage to a cell and you depolarize the membrane for a very short fraction of a time, maybe five milliseconds. And what you do is you open up holes in the bacteria wall you, in the membrane so you can now inject synthetic cargo or plasmids that you want. So that now it could be RNA, DNA, and you've modified the cell into a synthetic machine, right? The electroporators, it turns out, cost thousands of dollars at these high schools, even in Georgia. So there's a lesson here that even for frugal science, we go all the way across the world, turns out even in our backyard, <laughs> for kids to be able to do things. So they asked me if I could purchase an electroporator for them. The gist is of its functioning is you have to apply a voltage. The voltage you need is about 2,000 volts, 5 milliseconds. Well, the answer is right here, and so I, I was just giving a talk, and I'm saying, I'm, so right now, this is what I'm doing. I'm just clicking on the lighter, and you can hear this noise. So every time, you know, on 4th of July, when you're doing your barbecue, you play with this. So again, the key is in the noise. So what's happening over here? It turns out, so what I just did was press the button and you hear this tick. In fact, when you stub and you actually twist the knob, you hear this tick, 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 tick. You see a spark on your barbecue lighter. And you can buy this at any gas station. Turns out that every time you click on the spring-based mechanism, there is a tiny metallic hammer that's going, and we've calculated this, at 30,000 meters per second square, hits a tiny piezoelectric crystal, and generates about 2,200 volts in less than 5 milliseconds due to piezoelectricity, the phenomena that the Curie brothers discovered. And so this lighter is a pretty robust and remarkable and repeatable feat of engineering that generates these voltages. Of course, the butane is just to kind of use that spark to light a flame. And so we take this piece of engineering, you can buy at any gas station, 30 cents. In fact, my high schoolers cannot buy lighter, so I have to buy it for <laughs> them. And then we understood the physics of this object, and it turns out that that voltage is perfectly poised, so we take E. coli, and then we put GFP molecules in there, and lo and behold, we do our tests, and the E. coli turn green, and you can do a lot of different things. You can put it on mammalian cells and yeast cells. And so here we have something for 20 cents. You now have an electroporator, and we're writing this paper up. And so what I'm proud is that the first author is a high schooler, second author is an undergrad in my lab, third author is a high school science teacher, and the fourth author is, you know, an early career researcher. Uh, we've talked about two things, the paper fuge, we've talked about the... Electropen. The... We're calling it the electropen. Because wow. the, I didn't bring the actual device, but the kids yeah. have it. It looks just like a pen. You just hit a button and you put it on a okay. glass slide and you can inject. And I think you have, uh, I think you've got another one that maybe, maybe you want to highlight something around a hearing aid? The 30,000 feet view and the need that we're trying to address is that currently for, uh, for the audience who's listening, you know, every, you, you may use hearing aids or no parents or grandparents who use hearing aids. And it turns out these things cost a lot of money. They are thousands of dollars. In the U.S. in August 2017, uh, the Senate passed a bill to tell their FDA to figure out how to bring hearing aids as over-the-counter devices because as you grow older, just like you need reading glasses that you can go to buy at a CVS, you should be able to buy hearing aids. And so we were motivated by this, uh, uh, this need for affordable hearing aids, not just in the U.S. Turns out this is, you know, a global issue and thousands of dollars for a device that you would ask, it's just amplifying sound, or is it? And asking, what is, you know, a low-cost device that we could build? My undergraduate student who's leading this, uh, he's a chemical engineer and was born with uh, hearing impairment in both his ears. And so that's one of the things that's uh, beautiful is sometimes we solve these problems because we, we resonate with the challenges that 
you know, lack of one sense that we might have, other vision or hearing. And he is obsessed and driven by this problem. And so the device we've made is a low-cost hearing aid, and it falls within our frugal science philosophy. And we're at the stage of demonstrating that, you know, indeed, we could have a really ultra-low-cost device. And starting to ask the question, what is the bare minimum device that we can have that, that is effective? And those are hard questions to investigate, but we, you know, we're, that's the current project that we're working on. If it's okay, I'm going to change directions a little bit and just talk about your background and, you know, how how you got attracted to engineering, you know, how you developed the curiosity you have and the skill sets around the problems and what kind of advice you give to young people based on your experience, your pathway. So this is the part of the conversation which I wish I had a story where I could say as a kid I was fascinated by science and engineering and I played with built, you know, rockets and stuff. Unfortunately, my story is I wasn't much into science. I was an average kid, and uh, I, in fact, sometimes was below average. I still have a report sheet that shows I got a zero in math, and I failed, and I uh, struggled. I think a lot of it has to do with having the right set of mentors uh, who got me excited. And I think the best way I can describe it is, is allowed me to come into myself and be myself and look at, uh, they shared their view, philosophy of how to approach problems and what they found exciting in science. And so I have this collection of things I get excited by, whether it's organisms or hearing aids. And so it's a combination of mentors and just being yourself and uh, finding some place where you're allowed to be that and, you know, do the best you can. What makes you the an uncommon engineer? I think what makes me an uncommon engineer, there are two parts of this. One is the tangible part is to develop these products that scale, you know, to less than a dollar, uh, direct impact. But the second, uh, more indirect, which uh, helps me sleep at night and I feel uh, satisfaction as an educator, is I show these devices and often with my, whether it's a high school kid or a medical uh, person out in the field without any education, often they see this and they say, huh, I could have done that. And to me, that's what the engineering skill set is, is to, because we are all problem solvers. You are a problem solver, Steve. If things break, you will fix them in your house, in your car, in your research lab, in your life. And almost every, all of us are. And that ability as an engineer to kind of empower people both with devices, but use that device as a way to kind of let them realize that the things they are putting on themselves are just self-imposed limits. And I don't know, that to me is the way we will solve these grand challenges if we empower the next generation of students and uh, people in the communities who know the problems the best and who feel that, hey, we can do this, I think over the next couple of decades, they're going to be able to best solve these problems. In your voice is, uh, is a huge dose of optimism. And I, I share that same optimism. And I think the thing that we're lucky to have you here at Georgia Tech is, is that I inside it, you're saying um, all the ways we've been thinking before clearly aren't working, right? <laughs> we have all of these challenges and problems, and so if we have, and that's the wonderful thing about being at a university, is, is that we have that freedom to really think, our job is to think differently, and to really think, to be uncommon, and uh, to try to come at problems with a different way, because a lot of the approaches we're taking to solve solving problems just simply aren't working. So thanks for being here. Thanks for the approach that you're taking, and hopefully there'll be as many students as we can connect to that uh, really creative way of thinking. So we really, really appreciate you being here, Saad. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. For now, that's all for The Uncommon Engineer. I'm Steve McLaughlin. Thanks for listening. Thank you.